If blockchain are countries, blockchain bridges are like airlines. And if you are a blockchain developer, sooner or later you will need to integrate your dApp with a blockchain bridge. In this video, I will explain what are the different blockchain bridge technologies and what are their pros and cons. If you are new here, my name is Julian and I've been a blockchain developer since 2017. Blockchain bridges are used to move crypto assets across blockchains. For example, with a bridge, you can move some USDC from Ethereum to Polygon. There are dozens of bridges already in production. And with an ever-increasing number of crypto assets and blockchains, we will see more and more bridges. But wait a second, why would we even need to move assets across blockchains? Let's see a couple of examples. Let's say that you receive a large payment of USDT on Ethereum. Later, if you want to do a lot of small transfers, you might prefer to do them on the Polygon blockchain, which has lower transaction fees. But for this, you will need to move your crypto to Polygon first. Let me give you another example. On the blocks, some people bought my course using USDT on Polygon. But the crypto exchange that I use doesn't connect to Polygon. To cash out this USDT, I had to transfer it to Ethereum first so that I could send my crypto to a centralized exchange and convert it to fiat. And finally, it's impossible to design one blockchain for every use case. Every blockchain has been designed for a specific purpose. So it makes sense that users will use several blockchains and will need some level of interoperability. There are two categories of bridges, centralized or decentralized. Centralized bridges depend on a centralized entity. Users need to give up control of their crypto, which means users need to trust the centralized entity. But these bridges offer a better user experience. It's cheaper, faster, and more reliable. Decentralized bridges operate using smart contracts and algorithms. Users always remain in control of their funds, and they don't need to trust anyone. It's trustless. However, these bridges have a worse user experience. It's more expensive, slower, and less reliable. Okay, so next, let's dive deeper and see some specific bridge technologies. The first type of blockchain bridge is a notary. Let's say our user Bob wants to transfer some tokens between two blockchains, for example, from Ethereum to Polygon. First, Bob will send the tokens to a smart contract on Ethereum. The tokens will be locked in the smart contract. A trusted third party called a notary will detect the transaction. And then it will trigger another smart contract on the Polygon blockchain. Finally, this smart contract will mint a token the transfer is completed. And it's also possible to do the opposite operation from Polygon to Ethereum. Okay, but what about security? From the point of view of the user, Bob, the bigger risk is that after locking his tokens on the first blockchain, nothing happened. The third party could either go offline or not forward the transaction to the second blockchain. That's why the notary needs to be trusted. From the point of view of the token holders, the worst that can happen is a double spend, meaning that for one token locked on the first blockchain, the user is able to mint several tokens on the second blockchain. That would mean free money for this user at the expense of all the others. To prevent this, there are several security mechanisms. First, when a user locks his token on the first blockchain, the transaction contains a nonce. Nonce is a number to identify each transaction. A smart contract on the second blockchain can use these nonce to prevent the same transaction to happen again. But wait a second, there is an even bigger problem. How the second blockchain can make sure that the token were actually locked in the first blockchain? Remember, a blockchain can only know what's happening inside its own ecosystem. It doesn't have access to the outside world. The user could pretend to have locked his tokens on the first blockchain and fool the second smart contract. For that, all he has to do is to create a transaction and directly send it to the second blockchain without sending it to the first blockchain. And he can repeat the process many times, essentially getting free money. That's why we need a trusted intermediary, the notary. Before triggering the minting process on the second blockchain, the notary will make sure that the tokens were actually locked on the first blockchain. So what are the pros and cons of a notary bridge? The biggest advantage is its simplicity. It's simple to implement and it also has a good user experience. Users lock their tokens, wait a bit, then they receive their tokens on the second blockchain. And that's why most real-life blockchain bridges use this design. The biggest disadvantage is the dependency on the notary. This forces users to trust a centralized entity. 
it's possible to reduce this dependency with so-called federated bridges where instead of a single notary there is a group of trusted validators. It's better than a single entity, but it's still not fully decentralized. The second type of blockchain bridge is optimistic bridges. With optimistic bridges, a user locks a token in a smart contract on the first blockchain. Then a relayer forwards this transaction to a smart contract on a second blockchain to trigger the withdrawal, but without checking if the tokens were locked on the first blockchain. That's why we call this bridge optimistic. We assume that most transactions are valid. After a certain time, the token is available for withdrawal on the second blockchain. But why are we so optimistic? Anybody can cheat the system, right? If the transfer didn't happen on the first blockchain, anybody can send a proof of that to the smart contract of the second blockchain. I won't go into the details, but it's possible to produce such proof by using so-called Merkle proofs. This will cancel the withdrawal. The main benefit of optimistic bridges is that we don't need to rely on a centralized third party, unlike for notary bridges. The main drawback is that we need to have an army of people that monitors the bridge and flag fraudulent transactions. If they don't do their job, it's possible for someone to create fraudulent transfers. This video is sponsored by QuickNode. QuickNode is one of the best developer platforms to create blockchain applications. They cover most major blockchains, they offer high-level APIs for NFTs and tokens, they also provide real-time notification for on-chain events, and they also cover IPFS. In short, QuickNode provides the most robust blockchain API with unmatched performance and reliability. That's why the biggest blockchain applications use QuickNode like OneInch, Chainlink and Dune Analytics. So go create your free account on QuickNode and make sure to use the coupon code of EatTheBlocks to access their premium features. The link and coupon code are down below. Back to blockchain bridges. The next type of blockchain bridge is hash time lock contract or just HTLC. This one is really interesting, so pay attention. Let's say that we have two blockchains, Ethereum and Polygon. Bob has an ERC20 token on Ethereum called Token A, and Alice has another ERC20 token on Polygon called Token B. And they want to exchange their token. First, Bob will pick a secret. This is like a password that will be used to unlock the tokens. Bob will then calculate the hash of the secret. A hash is a cryptographic signature. Next, Bob will deploy an HTLC smart contract on Ethereum and send token A to this contract. This HTLC contract is coded to release token A to Alice only if she knows the secret. But the secret itself is not known by the smart contract. The smart contract only knows the hash of the secret. And that's enough to verify if someone knows the secret. Next, Alice will deploy another HTLC smart contract on the Polygon blockchain and she will send token B to this contract. This HTLC contract is coded to release the token B to Bob only if he knows the secret. Once again, the contract only knows the hash of the secret, not the secret itself. Next, Bob is going to withdraw token B from the HTLC contract on Polygon by providing the secret. When Bob withdraws the token, the secret will be revealed publicly and saved in the blockchain. This is very important. It means that Alice can see the secret. So next, Alice will use the secret to withdraw token A on the HTLC contract on Ethereum. And that's it, the transaction is completed. But wait a second, is this safe? When the secret is revealed, everybody can see it. However, the HTLC contract is coded so that only Alice can restore the tokens from it. So it doesn't matter that the secret is public. Okay, but what about if Bob never withdraw token B from Polygon? Will token B be locked forever? No, because there is a security mechanism to address this. Bob only has a limited time to withdraw token B from Polygon. If he doesn't, Alice can take her tokens back. Likewise, if Bob locks his token first, but Alice never locks her tokens on Polygon, Bob can have his tokens back. There are a few advantages to HTLC, like it's 100% decentralized. At no point we rely on a centralized third party. There is no counterparty risk. The transaction is either completed for both parties or not at all. But there are also a few disadvantages. First, an HTLC bridge is complex to use. Second, an HTLC bridge is slow. And finally, you can only use an HTLC bridge if both blockchains have smart contract capabilities. 
The last type of bridge technology is Zero Knowledge Bridge. If you never heard of Zero Knowledge, it's a groundbreaking cryptographic technology and it has amazing use cases for blockchains. In a nutshell, Zero Knowledge allows anyone to certify that they know a piece of information without revealing this piece of information. What? Yes, I know. The first time I heard this, I had to think about it a couple of times before I got it. This stuff is crazy. So how are we going to use zero knowledge proof in our bridge? First, a user locks his token on the blockchain. Then the bridge generates a zero knowledge proof. This proof cryptographically attests to the truthfulness of the transaction without revealing the specifics of the transaction itself. For instance, a specific type of zero knowledge proof called ZK Snacks can be used for this purpose. The second blockchain receives the zero knowledge proof and verifies it. This verification ensures that the transaction on the first blockchain is valid. Once the proof is verified, the second blockchain will finalize the transfer. One of the biggest advantages of a zero knowledge bridge is privacy. All the details of the transactions remain private, revealing only what's necessary. Another advantage is efficiency. Instead of processing all transactions details, blockchains only need to handle and verify the proof which reduce the computational burden. The last advantage is interoperability. By abstracting transaction details into proof, zero-knowledge bridges can improve interoperability between chains with different technologies. However, the biggest disadvantage of zero-knowledge bridge is their complexity. Implementing and understanding zero-knowledge proof, especially in a cross-chain environment, can be technically challenging. Okay, but what about real-life blockchain bridges? According to DeFi Lama, $5 billion were processed by blockchain bridges in October 2023. And we can also see the ranking of the most popular bridges. Some of them are very specialized and can only transfer crypto across two blockchains like the Polygon or Arbitrum bridge. And others allow to connect many more blockchains like Stargate. Okay, so now you know everything about blockchain bridges, or almost. One of the most interesting blockchain bridge technology is Polygon CCIP. It's brand new technology and it's getting a lot of traction. And if you want to dive into this new tech, check out this other video. It will explain everything you need to know about Polygon CCIP. And once you watch it, you can finally call yourself a blockchain bridge expert. All right, that's it for this video. See you next time.